Um, so Amory B. Lovins, a consultant physicist and innovator in energy and its links with resources, security, development, and environment, has advised the energy and other industries for four decades, as well as the United States Department of Energy and the Department of Defense. His work in 50 plus companies, excuse me, countries, has been recognized by the Alternative Nobel, Blue Planet, Volvo, Zayad, Onassis, Nissan, Shingo, and Mitchell Prizes, MacArthur and Ashaka Fellowships, the Benjamin Franklin and Happold Medals, 12 honorary doctorates, and the Heinz Lindbergh Time, Hero for the Planet, National Design, and World Technology Awards. <sighs> A Harvard and Oxford dropout, former Oxford Don, honorary architect and Swedish engineering academian, he's briefed 23 heads of state, written 31 books, and over 490 papers. Co-founder and chairman emeritus of Rocky Mountain Institute, an independent nonprofit think and do tank that drives the efficient and restorative use of resources. His work as its chief scientist has lately included leading the <clears throat> leading super-efficient redesigns of numerous buildings, several vehicles, and over $30 billion worth of industrial facilities in 29 sectors. He led the creation of two of RMI's for-profit spin-offs, eSource and FiberForge, which he chaired until 2007. His latest books with various co-authors include Natural Capitalism, Small is Profitable, Winning the Oil Endgame, The Essential Amory Levins, and Reinventing Fire. The most recent of his visiting posts at 10 universities was as the 2007 Map Ming Professor at Stanford University's School of Engineering, and he's currently the Professor of Practice at the Naval Postgraduate School. He's a member of the Advisory Board to the Chief of Naval Operations and of the National Petroleum Council. In 2009, Time named him one of the world's 100 most influential people, and Foreign Policy named him one of the 100 top global thinkers. Hopefully someday we'll be soon enough to have a president name him Secretary of Energy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Amory Levins. Thanks. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. After that generous introduction, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, I'm happy to have the honor to share with you the findings of an ambitious synthesis of U.S. energy solutions that 60 of us and myself uh, at RMI developed during a year and a half. We published two and a half years ago uh, as a business book called Reinventing Fire. Um, if you get it electronically, I would suggest the Google Books version because it's very graphics and layout intensive, so it doesn't read well in Kindle. Uh, there's also a mushed up trees version. Um, <clears throat> it has a foreword by the president of Shell Oil and the then chair of Exelon, which is the nation's largest nuclear and third largest coal-fired utility. This may surprise you a bit when you hear what it's about. Uh, and we had a lot of help from industry on both content and peer review. Um, <clears throat> this, this country has a very peculiar public conversation about energy, which if we stated it clearly and boiled it down, would amount to a stupid multiple choice test. Namely, would you rather die of A, oil wars, or B, climate change, or C, nuclear holocaust? <laughs> Or D, all of the above. <laughs> oh, I missed one. Or E, none of the above. That's the choice we're seldom offered. But what if we could make energy do our work without working our undoing? Could we imagine fuel without fear? Could we reinvent fire? And my colleagues and I chose that big poetic title because long ago fire made us human and then fossil fuels made us modern. But now we need a new fire that makes us safe, secure, healthy, and durable. That's now feasible. In fact, it works better and costs less than what we are doing. So let's see how. Four-fifths of the world's energy still comes from burning each year four cubic miles of the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo, <laughs> extracted and delivered with immense skill. 
Those fossil fuels have built our civilization, created our wealth, and enriched the lives of billions of people. But their rising costs to our security, economy, health, and environment are eroding, if not outweighing their benefits. So we need a new fire. And switching from the old fire to the new fire means changing two big stories, oil and electricity, each of which puts two-fifths of the fossil carbon into the air. These stories are essentially distinct uh, because less than 1% of our electricity is made from oil. Less than 1% of our oil makes electricity. So they have essentially nothing to do with each other. But they are similarly concentrated in their uses in that three quarters of the oil fuels transport, three quarters of the electricity powers buildings, and the rest of both runs factories. So very efficient uh, transport and land use buildings and factories save a lot of oil and coal, which still makes two-fifths of our electricity, and natural gas that can displace both. But today's energy system isn't just inefficient, it's also aging, dirty, disconnected, and insecure. So it needs refurbishment. By 2050, though, it could become efficient, connected, and distributed with elegantly frugal vehicles, buildings, and factories, all relying on a secure, modern, and resilient electricity system. So we can eliminate our addiction to oil and coal by 2050 and use a third less natural gas while switching to threefold more efficient end use and three quarters renewable supplies. That's the transition I'll describe for you. By 2050, we found this could cost the United States $5 trillion less than business as usual in net present value, assuming that carbon emissions and all other hidden or external costs are worth zero, a conservatively low estimate. Uh, but this cheaper energy system could support a 158% bigger economy, all without needing oil or coal or, for that matter, nuclear energy. Moreover, this transition would need no new inventions and no new federal taxes, subsidies, mandates, or laws, thus end running Washington gridlock. Let me say that again. I'm going to tell you how the United States can get completely off oil and coal, $5 trillion cheaper, with no act of Congress led by business for profit. The idea is to uh, make the needed policy change changes administratively or at a state level, which is where we've long made most of our energy policy anyway, uh, and to <coughs> use our most effective institutions, private enterprise, co-evolving with civil society, sped by military innovation, to go around our least effective institutions. And whether you care most about profits and jobs and competitive advantage, or about national security, or about environmental stewardship, climate protection, creation care, stronger communities, public health, regardless of your priorities, uh, reinventing fire makes sense and makes money. Now, General Eisenhower reported, reputedly said <laughs> that expanding the boundaries of a tough problem makes it soluble by encompassing more options and synergies and degrees of freedom. Normally we try to chop a tough problem into small bite-sized pieces, but Eisenhower's advice was instead to move the boundaries out until they include what the solution requires. Therefore, in Reinventing Fire, we integrated all four sectors that use energy, transportation, buildings, industry, and electricity, and my colleagues and I have had the good fortune to uh, work in equal depth in all four of those. And we integrated four kinds of innovation, not just technology and public policy, but also two more powerful ones that are usually ignored, <coughs> namely design, the way technologies are combined, and strategy, new business models, new competitive strategies. And when you properly combine all four forms of innovation, you get a lot more than the sum of the parts, and you create some deeply disruptive business opportunities. In truth, we would save a lot more than $5 trillion. Uh, for example, this country burns oil costing $2 billion a day, but that leaves out hidden costs paid not at the pump but through our taxes and incomes, uh, totaling at least $4 billion a day, 
or one and a half trillion dollars a year in three roughly equal parts. The first half trillion dollars a year is sucked out of the economy by OPEC's monopoly pricing, uh, which our uh, uh, oil dependence makes possible. And then there's oil's price volatility, which whipsaws the whole economy. For 40 years, oil price spikes have preceded every recession. But I'm not talking about those dislocations. I'm talking about just the daily jitter of oil prices. That volatility imposes on every oil user risk and therefore cost that the market values at about a half trillion dollars a year. And then we pay the third half trillion dollars a year to keep military forces uh, ready for Persian Gulf interventions. That's about 10 times what we pay for oil from the Persian Gulf. Uh, and in fact, it rivals total US defense spending at the height of the Cold War. Oil is also finite. The Pentagon is preparing not to need any. The rest of us should too. We should get off the stuff just to improve our security and save money at the pump, even if the hidden costs that our analysis did not count weren't tripling the pump price effectively and raising the total cost of oil upwards of a sixth of GDP. Plus, I haven't counted this yet, any damage to health, safety, environment, global stability, global development, or our nation's independence and reputation. Remember, I didn't count any of that stuff. This is all about private internal cost. Now, where to start? Well, since nearly half of our oil fuels automobiles, let's start by getting autos off oil. Now, two-thirds of the energy needed to move a typical car is caused by its weight. And every unit of energy you save at the wheels by taking out weight or drag or rolling resistance saves another six units of energy you don't need to waste getting it to the wheels, so it saves seven units of fuel at the tank. Huge leverage for light weighting. But for the past quarter century, our cars have suffered an epidemic of obesity. Uh, they now weigh two tons. They've gained weight twice as fast as we have. Uh, <laughs> but today, ultralight and ultra-strong materials like carbon fiber composites uh, can make dramatic weight savings snowball and can make autos simpler and surprisingly cheaper to build, as I'll explain. Lighter and more slippery autos also need less force to move them so their engine becomes smaller, and their, those vehicles' fitness, taking the obesity out of the car, then makes electric autos affordable because you need two or three times fewer of those costly batteries or fuel cells. They get lighter, they get smaller, cheaper, so the sticker price of the vehicle falls to about today's level, and of course the driving cost per mile is much lower from the start. So this specific sequence of innovations, ultralight then electric, can transform automakers from wringing tiny savings out of essentially Victorian uh, steel stamping and engine technologies to the steeply falling costs of three uh, mutually reinforcing technologies, the ultralight materials, uh, their structural manufacturing techniques, and electric propulsion. And if you are exploiting three steep and synergistic learning curves while your competitor is out on the flat part of one learning curve, you win. The sales of such vehicles can grow and their prices can drop even faster with a temporary fee bait, that is uh, rebates on efficient new autos paid for by fees on inefficient ones. Uh, programs on those lines are now uh, running in five European countries and Singapore. The biggest program in France uh, in its first two years tripled the speed of improving auto efficiency. Uh, for any economists in the crowd, uh, uh, the uh, effect of a good fee bait is to arbitrage the spread and discount rate between private buyers and society. So as a car buyer, instead of just looking at the first year or two of fuel saving so it's as unimportant as whether to buy floor mats, uh, you'll look at the full life cycle fuel saving in which society has a strong interest and you'll be able to take that long view when you make your private car purchase. The resulting shift to electric autos is going to be as game-changing as uh, shifting from small refinements in typewriters to the 
dramatic Moore's Law driven gains in computers. And of course, uh, computers and IT are the biggest industry in America now, while typewriter makers have vanished. Uh, so vehicle fitness opens a powerful new automotive competitive strategy that doubles oil savings over 40 years. It makes affordable the uh, electrification that can save the rest of the oil, and it also largely de-risks the auto business. Now, a lot of countries like America or China or Japan uh, could be leading this next automotive revolution. There are formidable barriers, but they're much more cultural than they're technical or economic, and we're working with industry on overcoming them. Uh, but the current leader is Germany. Uh, last year, Volkswagen uh, began low-volume production of this two-seat carbon fiber plug-in hybrid at 235 miles a gallon. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, BMW began ramping up mid-volume production of this carbon fiber electric car uh, whose carbon fiber, they say, is paid for by needing fewer batteries. And their CEO says, we do not intend to be a typewriter maker. Because he can look across Munich to where Olympia used to make excellent typewriters. Uh, a couple of years ago, Audi showed a carbon fiber plug-in hybrid concept SUV rated at over 250 miles a gallon. Strikingly similar to one I'll show you in a minute that we designed 14 years ago. Uh, and there, there's some interesting things that American industry can bring to this party. Um, I brought my carbon cap today, <laughs> sort of 1914 Italian style. Uh, this is actually a test piece for military ballistic helmets that are now shipping. And you can tell from the sound it's extraordinarily stiff and strong. Let's pass it around as long as I get it back afterwards. Don't worry about dropping it. It's tougher than titanium. Uh, <laughs> Tom Friedman actually uh, whacked it with a sledgehammer as hard as he could and couldn't even scuff it. Uh, <clears throat> now, the techniques that were used seven years ago to make that piece in one minute can now make a complex two meter by two meter part in one minute uh, and uh, therefore achieve automotive cost and speed with essentially aerospace performance. So. If you applied that to U.S. automaking, you'd be saving four-fifths of automakers' capital needs, as I'll show you in a minute. You'd save a lot of lives because such materials can uh, absorb six to 12 times the crash energy of steel per pound and do so, or so much more smoothly so you can use the crush stroke or length up to twice as efficiently. Uh, and you would save oil equivalent just in the United States uh, to one and a half Saudis or half an OPEC uh, by drilling in a very prospective play called the Detroit Formation. Uh, <laughs> and those mega barrels under Detroit cost 18 bucks each, uh, which is to pay for the electrification because as you'll see in a moment, the ultralighting is approximately free. And those mega barrels are domestic, secure, carbon free, and inexhaustible. Now, how is the ultralighting free? Well, this is a mid-size SUV that our team designed 14 years ago with a couple of European tier ones. Um, 67 miles a gallon on gasoline, 114 on hydrogen, half normal weight, made of carbon fiber. Uh, it would actually be a lot lighter now. And a battery version uh, would be uh, much lighter than that, 500 and some kilos. Um, well, what's really fun is it was designed uh, to be optimally manufacturable out of carbon, not metal, clean sheet design. Uh, so if you look inside, there's only 14 body parts. Now, a normal steel SUV would have 10 or 20 times more parts than that in the body, each stamped with an average of four progressive high pressure steel stamping die sets. Here you've got just 14 parts, each with one medium pressure I said, so you save about 99% of the tooling cost. And then uh, these parts can each be lifted with one hand and no hoist. The biggest part on the side I can briefly lift with one finger. By the way, any of you who know aerospace will recognize this is an airframe. It's suspended from rings rather than built up from a tub, which is our horse and buggy legacy in the, in the car business. 
Uh, the parts snap precisely together for bonding, so you don't need the robotic body shop. And if you lay color in the mold, you probably don't need the paint shop either. So you just got rid of the two hardest and costliest steps in making the car. That's why you save 80% of the capital. And you also make the uh, propulsion system two-thirds th uh, uh, two smaller. So together, those savings pay for the carbon fiber, making the ultralighting approximately free. And carbon fiber is probably about to get a lot cheaper. The same design techniques uh, that we borrowed from the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works to, to do this design uh, enabled Toyota, we're told, to create this public record holder for ultralight concept cars. This is a uh, seven-year-old uh, car called the 1X, 1 over X, because it has the, the interior volume of a Prius, 1 over 1, half the fuel use, and a third the weight. 420 kilograms, or 400 if it were a plane hybrid like most Priuses rather than a plug-in hybrid. So really light. And lest anybody think they were doing this for amusement, uh, Toyota signaled its strategic intent by having Tore, the world's biggest carbon fiber maker, the day before this was shown, announce a big factory to mass produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota not a phrase previously heard in the industry, and then four other automakers joined the consortium. So Volkswagen and BMW will soon gain worthy competitors from that consortium and several others, and not only in Japan. Now, the same physics and the same business logic apply also to big vehicles. Uh, Walmart's heavy trucks, the biggest civilian fleet around, uh, a couple of years ago, we're using 44% less fuel than in 2005 to deliver a case of merchandise, uh, thanks to smarter logistics and better truck design. Uh, a YouTube was just posted about a uh, concept truck they're testing. They haven't published the numbers yet, but it has very interesting aerodynamics and a carbon fiber trailer. And uh, <clears throat> it, it turns out the technical potential for heavy trucks that they're aiming to capture is to save two-thirds of the fuel. Uh, and if you combine that with the triple to quintuple efficiency airplanes now being designed at places like Boeing and uh, MIT and NASA, you end up with net present valued fuel savings in heavy vehicles of about $0.9 trillion. Now, in both light and heavy vehicles, uh, today's military revolution in energy efficiency is going to speed all of these advances in the civilian sector, which uses over 50 times as much oil, in much the same way that military R&D in the past has given us the internet, the global positioning system, the microchip industry, the jet engine industry, and created much of the modern economy. But this time, the leverage back to the civilian sector is going to be in speeding our journey off oil, so we don't need to fight over oil. And then our warfighters can have nega missions in the Persian Gulf, mission unnecessary. And they really like that idea. As we design and build vehicles better, we can also use them a lot smarter. This is a typical um, congestion graph for the United States with the morning and evening rush hours. And if that were an electricity load shape, we would throw a lot of IT-enabled pricing and smart grid and demand response at it to try to flatten out those peaks. But by not yet doing that for road traffic, we are wasting many billions of dollars a year through idle people, idle vehicles, and idle roads. However, we don't need to just sit back and watch traffic double as is still officially forecast, because we have four proven techniques for eliminating needless driving. We can charge drivers for their road infrastructure, uh, not by the gallon, but by the mile. We can use some smart IT to enhance transit and enable car sharing and ride sharing. The uh, average car sits idle 96% of the time, permitting all sorts of interesting business models. Uh, <clears throat> we can encourage developers to use new urbanist and smart growth uh, models that enable more people to be already where they want to be so they don't need to go somewhere else. And we can use uh, IT to make traffic free flowing. So when you combine the 
proven <coughs> performance of those four approaches, you end up getting the same access with 46 to 84 percent less driving and also with better communities and stronger families. And this saves another point four trillion dollars worth of fuel. Uh, and then there's another point three trillion to be saved from smarter use of trucks, better truck logistics. Now pretty soon you're talking real money. So 40 years hence, a far more mobile U.S. economy could be using no oil. And saving or displacing each barrel turns out to cost $25. And doing that rather than buying the, a barrel of oil for over 100 bucks saves you $4 trillion net present value. If, by the way, I had counted just the hidden economic and military costs of our oil dependence, that would be a $12 trillion saving. But we didn't do that. Um, so to get mobility without oil, to phase out the oil, we can first get efficient, then switch fuel. So the magenta is the savings already baked into the government forecasts. The blue is the additional savings from vehicle fitness, not in the forecast. The aqua is savings from more productive use of vehicles. And then the 120 to 240 mile per gallon equivalent autos can run on any mixture of hydrogen in green, electricity in yellow, or advanced biofuels in orange. The heavy trucks and the airplanes can realistically run on hydrogen or advanced biofuels, or the trucks could run on natural gas, but no vehicle will need oil. Uh, and any biofuels we might need, at most just three million barrels a day, could be made two-thirds from waste, and you could make all of it rather readily without displacing cropland and without harming climate or soil. In fact, we would probably pay farmers and ranchers for taking carbon out of the air and sticking it back in tilth where it belongs. So our little team at RMI speeds these oil savings by what we call institutional acupuncture, where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly. We insert little needles in selected points in our partners like Ford and Walmart and the Pentagon. Uh, <clears throat> and this long transition is already well enough underway that five or six years ago some mainstream analysts were already starting to see peak oil not in supply but in demand. That is forecasting that world oil use could peak in this decade and then decline because like whale oil in the 1850s, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. But electrified autos needn't add new burdens to the electricity system. Rather, when, when smart vehicles exchange electricity and information through smart buildings with smart grids, they are adding to the grid flexibility and distributed storage that help the grid to accept varying solar and wind power. So electrified autos make the auto and electricity problems previously unconnected uh, easier to solve together than separately. And they also converge the oil story with our second big story, saving electricity and then making it differently. And those twin revolutions in electricity promise more numerous, diverse, and profound disruptions already becoming clearly visible than any other sector uh, is experiencing or will experience because we've got 21st century technology and speed colliding head on with 20th and 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. Now, changing how we make electricity gets easier if we need less of it. Today, most of it is wasted and efficiency techniques keep improving uh, faster than they're being applied. So the unbought backlog or reserve, if you like, of potential savings keeps getting bigger and cheaper. But as buildings and industry start catching up and getting efficient uh, faster than they grow, uh, America's electricity use, instead of growing 1% a year as forecast, could actually shrink 1% a year after allowing for the extra use by those efficient electric cars. Uh, and in fact, something like this is happening, maybe even more so. Uh, U.S. use of both electricity and gasoline peaked in 2007, and both have been drifting down ever since as the economy grows. Uh, in 2012 alone, the weather-adjusted electricity used to make a dollar of real GDP 
fell by 3.4% in one year. And we can keep demand falling by reasonably accelerating existing trends. Uh, specifically, over the next 40 years, buildings, which I'll remind you, use three quarters of our electricity, can triple or quadruple their energy productivity, saving $1.4 trillion net present value with an eternal rate of return of 33%. Uh, that is, the savings are worth four times their cost. Industry can double its energy productivity with a 21% internal rate of return. And to achieve those things by 2050, we would just need by 2030 to have achieved nationwide on average a level of efficiency adoption uh, comparable to what the Northwest states did nine years ago, whatever exists as possible. Now, a key to such big savings is a disruptive innovation we've hatched at our mind for several decades called integrative design. It often makes very large energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into expanding returns. That's how our 2010 retrofit is saving two-fifths of the energy in the Empire State Building. Uh, we first remanufactured its 6,514 windows uh, <coughs> in a temporary window factory on the vacant fifth floor uh, into super windows. Um, all this was run by a Boulder firm, by the way. Um, windows that insulate several times as well as the previous double glazing and are almost perfect in passing light but blocking heat. And those plus better lights and office equipment and some other improvements cut the maximum cooling load by a third. But then we could renovate smaller chillers instead of adding bigger chillers, saving $17 million of capital cost, enough to pay for most of those improvements and thus reducing the payback time to just three years. That happens to be the payback offered by a major energy service company, which, however, would only have saved 7% because they optimized components in isolation. Uh, we got six times the savings for the same payback by optimizing the whole building as a system. They used disintegrated design. We used integrative design. Our latest cost-effective deep retrofit is actually in Denver. It's a difficult 48-year-old federal office complex, and uh, it's expected to save 70% of the energy within federal economic guidelines. That would make it more efficient than the best new office building in the country, which NREL has up the hill in Golden. Uh, now let's try a very different kind of building, uh, which looked like this a few weeks ago when we had 26 inches of snow in 24 hours. So this is where I, I live with my wife, Judy. Uh, it doesn't have to look like this to work like this. Um, but this is a, a house, jungle, and research center where we hatched Rocky Mountain Institute for the first 18 years. It's at 7,100 feet on the western slope in Old Snowmass near Aspen, uh, where we used to see temperatures as low as minus 47F, minus 44C. Um, the freezing point of mercury is minus 40, where F and C are the same. Um, so we joke we have two seasons, winter and July, because uh, we can get frost any day of the year. We've had it on the 4th of July, and we've had as much as 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. Uh, this building was actually the archetype of the European passive house movement, uh, which has over 30,000 ordinary looking houses and apartments that like ours, have and need no heating system, but have roughly normal construction cost. Now, let's go into the central atrium under our 14 windows, that is they, uh, sorry, our 12 and a half windows, they insulate like 14 sheets of glass, they look like two, they cost less than three. And it looks like this in a February snowstorm, you can see two of the five banana crops then ripening. That's two years ago, actually right now we have six banana crops ripening which is a record, um, numbers 48 through 53. These are two recent banana crops which a year ago uh, harvested themselves when their 30 kilos of weight pulled down the tree. Uh, Self-harvesting bananas, our latest innovation. So when, when we moved in, in in 84, this house was using about 1% the normal amount of space and water heating energy, uh, a tenth the normal electricity, half the normal water, 
all with a 10-month payback. Today's technologies are a lot better, so we've retrofitted them and we're monitoring about 300 data streams to see how much better they are. Um, the uh, trouble is the monitoring equipment seems to be using more electricity than the lights and appliances. <coughs> uh, and the, this approach works uh, in any climate. It's been used to eliminate air conditioning with lower construction cost and better comfort in an ordinary looking tract house in California up to 115F, 46C. Uh, it's been used to save 90% of the air conditioning energy in a uh, new house in steamy Bangkok uh, with normal construction cost and better comfort. Probably about everybody in the world lives in a climate somewhere between Bangkok and Old Snowmass. Uh, but wherever you are, the key is integrative design that gives you multiple benefits from single expenditures. So this white arch that holds up the middle of my house has 12 different functions, but it has only one cost. Integrative design can also increase the half trillion dollars of conventional energy savings in industry. Uh, Dow Chemical, for example, has already captured a $9 billion energy saving on a $1 billion investment. But there's a lot more to do. Uh, for example, three-fifths of the world's electricity runs <coughs> motors. Half of that runs pumps and fans. All those devices can be much improved, for example, the motor systems can typically save about half their energy with a year's payback if you properly integrate 35 kinds of retrofits. People normally do just three, so they save about a third as much energy at five times higher unit cost than they should. But before doing all that stuff to the motors, pumps, and fans, we ought to be capturing bigger and cheaper savings that are normally ignored, are not in any official study, are not in any engineering textbook as far as I know. For example, pumps, the biggest use of motors, move liquids through pipes. A typical industrial pumping loop, though, was redesigned to use at least 86% less pumping energy, not by getting better pumps or motors or controls or process, but just by replacing long, skinny, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. That also shrinks the pumping equipment and therefore capital cost. In our own house, we did a similar trick, um, and the Fat short straight pipes cut out 97% of the friction in a piping system we were putting in. And the capital cost went down because we went from seven pumps totaling over 2,000 watts to one pump of 43 watts. Uh, now, this is not rocket science. In fact, it's not a new technology. It's rearranging our mental furniture as designers. And what does that mean for the electricity that's three-fifths used in motors and half of that in pumps and in fans that have the same physics. Well, from the fuel like coal burned in the power plant, there are so many compounding losses that only a tenth of that fuel energy comes out the pipe as flow. But we can turn those compounding losses around backwards into compounding savings from right to left, and then every unit of, fuel or, or, of flow or friction we save in the pipe compounds back again to save 10 units of fuel and cost and pollution and what Hunter Levins calls global weirding back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and the capital cost goes down. So our team has lately found such snowballing energy savings in over $40 billion worth of industrial redesigns, very diverse ones from this Hewlett Packard data center and Texas Instruments chip fab to Rio Tinto and Anglo-American mines and Shell hydrocarbon facilities and a bunch more. Um, and typically our retrofit designs uh, in major plants that are supposed to be pretty good to start with save about 30 to 60 percent of the energy with two or three year paybacks. And in new facilities the savings are a bit bigger, around 40 to 90 plus percent, with generally lower capital costs. Again, expanding returns not diminishing returns. Economic theorists don't like expanding returns to show up in, in uh, energy efficiency because it makes their models blow up, which is embarrassing. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather just do the engineering and not worry about whether what works in practice can possibly work in theory. Uh, <laughs> now, needing less electricity would ease and speed the shift to new ways 
to produce electricity, chiefly renewables. China leads their explosive growth and their plummeting costs, shown here on a logarithmic scale for photovoltaic modules in blue and wind farms in green. Uh, <clears throat> both of those technologies in good U.S. sites are already marketplace winners and they'll even beat on levelized cost new combined cycle gas generation, um, even though they're generally subsidized less than non-renewables are. By the middle of last year, uh, solar power in the western U.S. was being contracted uh, to sell for as little as five or six cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, that's net of a 30 percent federal tax credit. Um, Midwestern wind power cost less than half that much. It was approaching two cents a kilowatt hour after a production tax credit that's about 1.8 to uh, 2.7 cents in levelized value. Now, in Germany, the installed cost of photovoltaic systems, and also in parts of Australia, is only half what it is here. We all buy the same equipment, but they install it in smarter and more streamlined ways. So, of course, we and others have time and motion teams running around Germany to figure out how they do it, and American installers are starting to get similar performance. I was told the other day of a, a new system, utility scale just contracted for $1.50 per installed system watt. Uh, it's getting quite exciting. And yet, even, and that, that by the way means that unsubsidized U.S. solar power in a good site at the German installed cost, but with our climate, would run around six cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but even before those uh, more streamlined methods of installation, today in 20 odd states, uh, developers will be happy to come put photovoltaics on your roof with no money down, which will soon turn to a cash back offer, and beat your utility bill. Uh, such unregulated products could ultimately add up to a virtual utility in a box uh, that bypasses power companies much as cell phones bypass wireline phone companies. And uh, that gives electricity executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams. Uh, in fact, it's happening right now <coughs> in Hawaii <coughs> where 10 or 15 percent of the houses have uh, are now using solar power and many are dropping off the grid because it's cheaper than staying on the grid. Rocky Mountain Institute put out a report last week called The Economics of Grid Defection showing that that choice of distributed solar plus distributed full storage beats the grid at various times rolling across the country during the life of existing utility assets. It's happening pretty fast. It's not perhaps the societally most efficient solution, but it's where you may get to if you have a utility that uh, tries to fight or block or tax solar competition, seeing it as a threat, because that tends to annoy the customers, so they're more likely to leave. There are actually uh, ways, at least four good ways, for incumbent electricity providers to turn the insurgency into a new business opportunity. and. Uh, we actually have at, at RMI two separate electricity practices out of our Boulder office, um, one aiding attackers, one aiding uh, defenders, because competition is good. <laughs> so we're playing both sides of the street. And actually our eLab, Electricity Innovation Lab, is a place where uh, the incumbents and insurgents can safely talk to each other and create mutual value rather than just lobbing grenades in public. Here's the big picture. Uh, worldwide, starting in 2008, half of all the new generating capacity added in the world has been renewable. And this graph shows the, the two biggest non-hydro additions, uh, wind power, which got depressed by some congressional meddling last year, uh, and photovoltaics, which added slightly more last year. Um, and you notice that they're each adding about 40 gigawatts a year. That is, <clears throat> non-hydro renewables uh, have, in each of the past three years, added a total of over 80 gigawatts and gotten a quarter trillion dollars of private investment. By the end of this year, they will have invested one and three quarter trillion dollars of private capital in the past decade. 
And the reason they can scale so fast is so obvious a lot of people miss it. We're used to thinking if you wanted more electricity, you would need to build something kind of like a cathedral. It would take 10 years and cost billions of dollars. But now, each year, you can build a photovoltaic factory whose annual output each year thereafter is enough solar cells that each year thereafter, that one year of production from one plant can produce as much electricity as your cathedral would have produced after a decade of construction. So it scales enormously faster. It's scaling faster uh, than cell phones. And <clears throat> wind is pretty fast too. Uh, China just doubled its wind power each of the past five years uh, to 2012 uh, when they made more wind power than nuclear power. Uh, they made more new electricity that year from non-hydro renewables than from all nuclear and fossil sources combined. And last year, China added more solar power than the U.S. has, even though we invented it. They can move incredibly fast. Uh, well, in this country, renewables were half of our new capacity added in 2012, 69% in Europe. Europe has well over a million new renewable energy jobs. Uh, in this country, we've got more solar jobs than we've got coal or steel jobs, and the solar jobs are growing 10 times faster than total employment. Uh, <clears throat> now, in contrast, excuse me. <coughs> Thank you. The non hydro renewables uh, have uh, now considerably more installed capacity than nuclear power, which had a half century head start, but whose net orders actually had gone negative before Fukushima. And orders for coal and nuclear plants worldwide are fading away because they have no business case. Actually, in this country, no merchant nuclear plant is financeable even though we've had nearly nine years of 100 plus percent construction subsidies on offer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, even existing nuclear plants are starting to shut down, even well running ones, as uneconomic to operate because they can't compete with efficiency or often gas or wind power. Actually in 2012, efficiency was nearly twice as important as gas in displacing U.S. coal. We're often told, though, that only the coal and nuclear plants can keep the lights on because they're 24-7, whereas solar and wind power are variable and thus supposedly unreliable. But neither part of that statement is true. First of all, variable does not mean unreliable. Uh, the red curve here is the output of all the French wind farms during a stormy winter month. And the blue is the forecast of that output one day ahead. I think we wish we could forecast demand that accurately. And then no generators 24-7, they all break. Uh, big ones tend to be down about 10 or 12 percent of the time, and when one of them breaks, you just lost a gigawatt in milliseconds, often for weeks or months, often without warning. So grids have always been designed to handle that intermittence of big thermal plants by backing up failed plants with working plants, and in exactly the same way, Grids can manage the forecastable variations of solar and wind. Uh, and <clears throat> that's, that's how you can get highly reliable power from largely or wholly renewable sources when they're forecasted, integrated, and diversified by type and by location. Uh, NREL has analyzed reliable and economically reasonable 80 or 90 percent renewable electric supply for the country. But that can also work for smaller areas. Let's take the isolated Texas grid, which is a pretty difficult case. In 2050, we simulated a, a summer load shape during a week that looks about like that, or like that if you use the electricity in a way that saves money. You get a smaller and, more, and, and, and less peaky load, but it's still about 30 gigawatts. So let's do all of that with renewables. Um, on an annual basis, let's do 86% with a combination of wind and photovoltaics. You can see how variable they really are. And then the other 14% with dispatchable renewables you can have whenever you want. That's all the rest of them. So geothermal, small hydro, burning municipal solid waste, burning energy studies, burning feedlot biogas in existing combustion turbines, 
uh, solar thermoelectric, which stores heat to run into or through the evening. Well, now you're 100% renewable, but it's still not a great match to the load shape, right? You have surpluses and deficits. So let's take the surpluses and put them into two kinds of distributed storage, namely ice storage air conditioning, like Ice Bear, and uh, smart charging and discharging of electric vehicles. And if those are both fully built out, you get so much distributed storage that you can get it back when you want, fill in the last bits with unobtrusively flexible demand, and now all the moving parts fit together. You have reliable power every hour of the year, and only 5% of it is left over to be spilled, so the economics will be very good. This is without adding any bulk storage. And indeed, without adding any bulk storage, uh, a number of European countries are already running their grid in exactly this way. Germany, the world's fourth biggest economy, is a quarter renewable uh, electricity. Uh, Denmark in 2012, 41%. Scotland, 40%. First half of last year, uh, which was rainy and windy, Spain, 48%. Portugal, 70%, up from 17% eight years earlier. Small countries can move fast. And these countries are doing exactly the choreography that we just saw in the Texas simulation. But this is not theoretical. They're doing it, and the lights stay on just fine. Actually, Germany and Denmark have the most reliable electricity in Europe, about 10 times as reliable as ours. Uh, you may read in the Wall Street Journal or Forbes that the German grid is becoming unstable. There is no evidence of this whatever. Um, part of a disinformation campaign. And by the way, back home, Iowa and South Dakota are about a quarter wind powered. Texas about a tenth, at times about 30 percent. Our own utility Excel has been over 60 percent wind powered for an hour. Big Island of Hawaii is 57 percent renewably powered now, heading for 70 percent within three years. Uh, you just need to run the grid in a different way. And there's another very important uh, step on the way to the expanding vision of an all-renewable European electric grid, and that is uh, decentralizing the production. Denmark used to have just a bunch of big coal plants. Now they have a constellation of wind and blue, 84 percent owned by farmers in their communities, and ag waste cogen in brown. Uh, and uh, I believe they were recently on one day, 131% renewably powered. Uh, <clears throat> and the country's going for all renewable energy of all kinds by 2050 at, they believe, essentially no extra cost. They've also reorganized their grid. It's turning into a cellular architecture that makes cascading blackouts impossible. That brings me to America's aging, dirty, and insecure electric system, we have to replace it anyway by 2050. It's just too old. But whatever we replace it with is going to cost the same, about $6 trillion net present value. Whether we buy more of what we have now, or new nuclear and so-called clean coal, or centralized renewables, or half distributed renewables, they all cost the same. Surprise. But those four futures differ profoundly in their risks around national security, fuel, water, finance, technology, climate, and health. Seven kinds of risk. This is a risk management play. For example, we have this over-centralized grid, very vulnerable to cascading and potentially economy-shattering blackouts caused by operational problems, rodents, uh, solar storms, superstorms, earthquakes, floods, physical attacks, cyber attack. We've recently had nearly all of those. Uh, but that blackout risk disappears and all the other six kinds of risk are best managed if we uh, reorganize distributed renewables into local microgrids that normally interconnect freely and exchange power through the grid but can stand alone at need so they can disconnect fractally and reconnect seamlessly. That is the Pentagon strategy for its own power supply at all its facilities because they need their stuff to work. Well, so do the rest of us whom they're defending. That's why we built our house to run this way, with or without the grid. And at about the same cost as business as usual, this resilient grid architecture could maximize national security and customer choice and entrepreneurial opportunity and innovation. So let me summarize the electricity story. Together, efficient use and diverse 
distributed, renewable, resilient supply can transform the sector. That's starting to happen. Traditionally, you know, utilities would build different kinds of giant power plants and occasionally a little efficiency of renewables, and we would reward them, as we still do in this state and altogether in, I believe, 36 states, for selling us more electricity. But especially in the other 14 or so states where we've changed the rules so we reward the utilities for cutting your bill, uh, the investment shifts massively towards efficiency, renewables, cogeneration, distributed storage, smart grids, ways to blend them all together reliably. And that is most true in the three-fifths of the country where demand-side resources can bid directly against supply-side resources in the same auctions. And demand-side stuff tends to win because it's cheaper. One auction and recently won 92% of the bids. So our energy future has a lot of choice, and the choices have expanded with fracking. Now let me say a little about that, because we are sometimes told that U.S. energy is permanently recommitting to fossil fuel thanks to this flood of cheap natural gas. Um, this graph uh, shows the abysmal track record of forecasting wellhead gas prices over the past quarter century by comparing all the official forecasts in blue with the actual in green. Uh, investors have lost their shirts at least three times in 15 years by betting on the forecasts once they lost over $100 billion on mistimed combined cycle plants, and we are told this time it will be different. So let me remind you of some basic financial economics. Frack gas is actually not cheap, but it is misdescribed, because to compare it with its volatile price fairly with a constant price resource like efficiency or renewables, no fuel, therefore no fuel price volatility, you have to add to the bare commodity price of the gas the market value of its price volatility. If you don't do that, it's the same mistake as choosing between a variable and a fixed rate mortgage looking only at the rate and not at the risk of losing your house <laughs> or constructing a portfolio of all junk bonds and no treasuries because you looked only at the uh, <coughs> yield or price but not also at the risk. You wouldn't do that for long. And yet this mistake is almost universally made in the energy sector today. Uh, not risk adjusting. Also, history suggests that if abundant frac gas were cheap at the wellhead, it, that would create supply-demand imbalances through petrochemical pivot to gas, LNG exports, uh, downstream infrastructure like pipe, uh, pipelines exploiting bottleneck uh, rents, and those would paradoxically tend to increase gas's price volatility. Now, consistent with this view, the futures market tells us that 10 years out, gas prices are not 2 or 3 or $4, they're about 6 or 8 bucks. When you count the volatility, you roughly double the price, and that's roughly what the futures market says. And you don't need to argue about a forecast, you can buy that gas right now. And it's reasonable for two reasons. One is that markets equilibrate. If you want 6 or $8 gas, assume 3 or $4 gas and use it accordingly. And secondly, <clears throat> there are about eight major categories of risk and uncertainty around fracking that will take about a decade to play out. And if they are all satisfactorily resolved, we will indeed have more cheaper gas for longer than we used to think, and optionality is good. But I wouldn't bet a whole lot of money on that outcome because eight is a big number. And some of these issues are quite difficult. Some of them are economically fundamental, like what is the output profile from a well, it falls off steeply at first, then what happens? Well, we've got data now from over 65,000 wells, and most of them <clears throat> do not actually level off. They keep falling enough that you need to refrack fairly often, so the economics are worse than we thought. And actually, dry gas, gas by itself, is generally uneconomic. Uh, it would take six, seven bucks to pay. Uh, and therefore, the activity now <clears throat> is essentially all driven by byproduct oil, which is present in fair abundance in a, a much smaller number of wells in certain plays, but it depletes faster. So there's about a, well, maybe 10 or 15 year bubble of oil, which is worth at least four times as much, especially because a lot of it's light sweet crude that's really valuable when Libyan is off the market and the 
refiners need that for a blend stock. So uh, once that oil bubble passes, you're face to face with the rather unpromising economics of dry gas. And uh, it's interesting how many countries, companies have lost how much money in that business. Uh, so at any rate, there, there is an important new reality here about abundant and stably priced energy for the long haul, but that story is much less about gas than about its physical hedges, efficiency, and renewables that are outpacing it and increasingly outcompeting it. And those resources are so abundant and affordable that our energy future is not fate but choice, and that choice is very flexible. Back in 75, <clears throat> our government and industry all insisted that the uh, primary energy needed to produce a dollar of real GDP could never go down. And it was heretical when I suggested in a foreign affairs article in 76 that it could go down threefold. What happened? Well, after a lot of debate, it actually went down by over half. We're pretty much on track. <clears throat> and now we actually have integrative design, far better technologies, much more mature financing and marketing and delivery channels. So we now have a very clear line of sight, which is all laid out in the book, to tripling efficiency all over again, and saving a kilowatt hour now costs only a third what it used to. So to solve the energy problem, we just needed to enlarge it and integrate it. And the results may at first uh, seem incredible, they <laughs> even surprised us a bit, but you know, as Marshall McLuhan said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries, he said, are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> <coughs> now, combine the electricity and oil revolutions and you have the big story, reinventing fire, where business, enabled and sped by smart policies in mindful markets, can lead the US, and I dare say a lot of other countries, off oil and coal by 2050, saving $5 trillion, <coughs> supporting a 2.6-fold bigger economy, and by the way, uh, reducing carbon emissions by 82 to 86 percent. Now, if you like any of those outcomes, any one or more, you can support this transition without needing to like every outcome and without needing to agree about which outcomes are most important. So if we focus on outcomes, not motives, <clears throat> we can turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge and those best buys are also the most effective solutions to the big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. Uh, by the way, uh, <coughs> RMI has teamed up with three leading organizations, uh, two of which are uh, under the National Development and Reform Commission in Chinese, China's central government, the other is the China Energy Group at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, to figure out what this logic I've just described for the U.S. would look like if rigorously applied in an economically explicit way to China using Chinese models, data, conditions, and examples. We're nine months into that two-year exercise. Um, I'm just back from Beijing last week uh, for our second set of review meetings. And <clears throat> the aim is partly to inform the emerging 13th five-year plan, uh, which uh, whose energy parts will be written by the people on our steering committee of ministers and state councilors. So this autumn we expect to complete a dramatically less energy intensive uh, scenario for China uh, and more, more renewable, achieving the same economic growth uh, at lower cost and with much less carbon emission, air pollution, and water use, so watch this space. And back at home, our team at, at RMI helps smart companies to get unstuck and speed this journey through various sectoral initiatives and projects. Uh, of course, there's still a lot of old thinking around, too. Uh, Marie Strong, who used to be an oilman, said not all the fossils are in the fuel. Uh, but as DuPont's former chairman, Edgar Woolard, uh, remarked, uh, firms hampered by old thinking won't be a problem, because in the long run, they won't be around. What I've described for you is not just a once in a civilization business opportunity. It's one of the greatest <coughs> transformations in the history of our species because we humans are really inventing a new fire. 
not dug from below, but flowing from above. I've even heard a theolo theologians talk about energy from hell and energy from heaven. And, <laughs> and the, uh, <laughs> this new fire is quite different. It is not scarce but bountiful, not local but everywhere, not transient but permanent, not costly but free, and but for the <coughs> transitional tail of natural gas and a little biofuel grown in ways that sustain and endure, this new fire is flameless and very efficiently used. It really could make energy do our work without working our undoing. Each of you owns a piece of that $5 trillion prize, and our book explains how you can capture that opportunity. So with the conversation begun at reinventingfire.com, and there's a, a TED Talk and a Foreign Affairs article and so on, uh, let me invite each of you to continue to engage with us, with each other, with everybody around you to help make the world healthier, richer, fairer, cooler, and safer by together reinventing fire. Thank you for who you are and what you do. Thank you, Amory. Um, so we've had way too many questions to get to here, um, several of which are on the future role of utilities. Are we going to continue to see large-scale plants versus distributed? So we'll save those. I recommend hitting the panel discussion, which starts in about 15 minutes, which is ex on exactly this topic. Um, so here's a simple one. Someone wants to know, what car do you currently drive? Well, I did drive a... Uh, my beloved uh, early hybrid called a uh, Honda Insight 2001, which, by the way, is all aluminum, and it weighs the same with two seats as that carbon fiber SUV weighs with five seats. That's how light carbon is. But they stopped making snow tires that size, so I can only drive it in the summer now, and therefore I drive a Ford Focus electric. I'm probably the only member of the National Petroleum Council with a an electric car whose license plate says off oil and that ain't aspirational. <laughs> That's done. <laughs> very nice. Um, so someone says they were driving in today um, from Wheat Ridge and it was very windy. They had trouble controlling their car. Are carbon fiber lightweight cars going to be more susceptible to wind on the road and things of this nature? Not if they're properly designed. If Let's see if we can see this in the model. Um, if you, eh, sort of. You look just above the window, there's actually, as the sides of the car come up, a drop of a few millimeters before the roof, and that's to create turbulence and spill the laminar flow uh, so that you don't get Bernoulli sucking on the down, downwind side. And there are a lot of very simple aerodynamic tricks like that that you can use to turn crosswind force into either neutral or downforce. Uh, and uh, the best proof of this is that the Sunracer ultralight um, carbon fiber solar cars that do the Trans-Australia race are sharing the road with these giant land caravans whizzing by at 100 miles an hour that can blow regular cars off the road. And the, the, these airfoil-like carbon ones are fine because they were designed to be stable. Okay. Uh, so on the same topic. Um, is carbon fiber re reusable and could it be incorporated into a cradle-to-cradle -cradle strategy? Yes. Um, the, it, it's at least as recyclable as steel. By the way, wherever that helmet is, we need to get it back. <laughs> uh, thank you. Very good. Thanks. Um, the, uh, let's see, briefly, conventional carbon fiber, uh, say race cars, uh, use a thermoset like an epoxy resin, and you can actually dissolve that with methanolysis or other solvolysis or uh, break it down with low temperature catalytic pyrolysis and get the carbon back. But it actually makes a lot more sense to make the car out of thermoplastic, uh, which is cheaper and twice as tough, like you just use nylon in the resin for a car. Uh, the one I passed around is polyether ether ketone, which is a fancy 
450C thermoplastic because you're making ballistic helmets out of it, but it doesn't have to be like that. Anyway, whatever the thermoplastic is, you just melt it off and the, the carbon fiber doesn't mind because it was made at over 1200C. Uh, then you can reuse the thermoplastic a few times, but that's the cheap part. The carbon is the expensive part. When you're making the preform, uh, you can lay it, you can make it a post form so the carbon doesn't get tangled because it's too stiff and fine to card like wool. So you, you don't want it tangled up. You want to keep it straight if you want to reuse it structurally. But actually, I'm not sure it's the right question. Yes, you, you can perfectly well have a closed loop and if that failed, you just chop it up and use it as reinforcement. It's still valuable. But th this material does not dent, rust, or fatigue. So it would make a lot more sense to think of it more like an airframe and lease a structural service. You know, the airplane I'll fly on this afternoon may have been in the air for 50 years. They just fed it engines, paint, avionics, and seats from time to time. And when you have such a durable structure, it makes sense to turn its durability into a source of value and just refresh it cosmetically and put in new powertrain and upgrade the software and so on, but keep the same uh, structure running for a very long time and not have to keep melting it down. Um, so we have a question about uh, the boulder electric, um, the municipalization of the utility here. What are your thoughts? Well, there's this predator prey coevolution that goes on all the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a long history of what happens when uh, franchises are up for um, shareholder owned utilities and if the municipality thinks they're not doing what the citizens want, it's free to buy them out, usually at depreciated net book value. Uh, and often we'll hire them back again to run the system, but the policy will then be set by the city. Uh, and I, I, I don't get involved in, in political disputes. We are completely apolitical, so I will steer clear of a political answer on that, but it's perfectly feasible to do that. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm, I think, uh, if the parties can't work it out uh, and get the results they both want, it may be litigated or otherwise resolved, but you can, you can have the kind of electric system you want one way or another. You're the customers uh, and uh, you are entitled to uh, buy out the assets. So I, I don't, I, I just think it's a business decision for Excel um, whether they want to uh, be more collaborative, and uh, we'll see. Right, so we have a question pertinent to a lot of people in the audience here. Uh, what advice would you have, would you offer to engineering and business students looking to start a career leading sustainable energy into the future? Well, learn about as many disparate and seemingly unrelated things as possible. <laughs> um, we have too many narrow specialists, that's why we're in the mess we're in. Um, so I would urge you to learn a lot of biology and social science, um, cultural anthropology. You know, any cultural anthropologist would have a field day looking at tribalism in the energy business, uh, <laughs> or businesses. Um, I've taught now at 10 universities, but I've only taught subjects I've never studied. It's a lot more fun that way because I could have beginner's mind. Uh, my, my, my background might, might be atypical, but I, I, I had a, a long track in, in physical science, but a parallel track that went chronologically, uh, music, classics, math, linguistics, some law, a little medicine, a lot of mountain photography. And I then started to diversify because in our line of work, you need to pick up a couple of new disciplines a year and you never know what they're gonna be. Maybe this year it's naval architecture and aerospace and maybe next year it's refinery engineering and mining engineering, but um, after 20 or 30 years of that, everything reminds you of something. <laughs> so I would, I would urge you while getting the fundamentals down uh, to jump the fences, walk on the grass. There, I'll let you in on a secret in case you haven't figured it out yet. I, I was lucky enough to figure this out early. There are few if any disciplines that a smart and motivated person cannot learn as much about in six months as most, not all, but most people in the field know. Once you realize that, you can be completely uninhibited in romping around in everybody else's turf and learning whatever you want and need to learn. And then you can be really effective. 
Thank you. Uh, so we had several questions about the shale gas boom and hydraulic fracturing. So to kind of sum them up, um, you say natural gas is here to stay at least for the short time, um, short foreseeable future. Um, is there anything better than fracking or should we just prepare to live with hydraulic fracturing and methane emissions? Well, efficiency and renewables are generally better uh, and often cheaper. And as I mentioned, uh, frac gas fed into a new combined cycle plant generally gives a higher uh, levelized cost of power than wind or solar power in decent western sites right now. Uh, <clears throat> but I think the big picture we're looking at is something like this. Uh, the savings already in the official forecast are in white. The further savings we showed from better technology and integrative design are in magenta. The uh, darker blue below that is for more productive use of vehicles. Then this big aqua wedge is the, I believe, quintupled renewables to 2050. Uh, this is natural gas, which goes down by a third. Now, I would say that's probably a conservatively high estimate of ultimate gas demand. Uh, two of our main conservatisms there are that we counted cogeneration only in industry, not also in buildings which is big, but we couldn't get good numbers for it at the time. And we did not count any solar process heat, even though much of it is already in the money, uh, and presumably concentrating solar thermal technologies at all scales will migrate in that direction as photovoltaics beat them in the electric market. They'll go into process heat and cogen. Um, but we didn't count any of that. and. Almost all of this demand, by the time you get there and the buildings are fixed up, is actually for process heat. So there will be a lot of competition with renewables that we didn't count. But meanwhile, <coughs> the uh, coal, uh, so, uh, let's see which way up is it? The, the nuclear, coal, and oil all phase out, vanquished by cheaper competitors. Um, and again, counting no externalities, no carbon pricing. Uh, and unless the gas uh, has low leakage, preferably 1% or less, not 3 plus, it doesn't ha uh, have a climate advantage over coal anyway. We're now figuring out what the leakage is. It's highly variable uh, by operator and location, and uh, we need to fix that right away. So we had a few questions about the Keystone XL pipeline. I think I know your answer to that one. Um, so we'll skip that. And well, I, but actually, you may not know my answer to it, which is that, <laughs> that um, if, I don't know what the president will decide, but if he decides not to allow it, it will probably save investors from considerable losses on what's already a big bubble. There's a terrific report out from Carbon Tracker, uh, which is a group of um, hydrocarbon industry financial analysts and deal makers. Uh, and they have analyzed the economics of the tar sands business, in which I have also worked. Uh, and they show it is the costliest thing on the global supply curve for liquid hydrocarbons. It is therefore extremely vulnerable to any dip in oil price or any increase in cost, including cost of capital or cost of transport. And uh, it's just a very fragile business. It's a bubble. And uh, I wouldn't want to have my money in it, even if I didn't care about its other implications. Well, it's been extremely enlightening. Everybody help me thank Emory Lovin. Thank you.